What's the situation like with the house and Duracell shitting? Oh! Oh, God! Oh, it's everywhere! Ah! <laughs> Greetings, fellow worker slaves, podcasting at 128 kilobits from the Fortress of Squalitude, not far from the Redneck Mecca. This is the Atheist in the Trailer Park podcast. I'm your host, Tucker. Professor Fuzznuts is somewhere. Um, Buttons is on my desk, staring out the window intensely. Leela is in my arms nuzzling my chin and Duracell is outside. Yes, it's a podcast hosted by a guy and his cats. Get over it. And this is a special episode, not because it's episode 200 for reasons I'll get to in a bit, but because there was a news article I saw this past week which inadvertently illustrates a very large problem we have in our society and dedicating an entire episode to it seemed to be the best way to discuss that larger problem. My apologies for the delay in getting this episode out. Um, It's a little hard to work on a script, especially one that involves more effort than the usual ones do, when one of your co-hosts insists on being held in your arms so they can nuzzle your chin, and one of your other co-hosts thinks that it's the only way to see something is by planting themselves directly in front of your monitor and staring out the window. (sighs) All right. First and foremost, you are no doubt wanting an update on the cat situation. Although, you now know that Duracell is outside. It has been about a week since my landlord last set a trap for the cats. Of the colony that was hanging around my place, all but two are gone. The two remaining ones are a female orange tabby and her torty kitten. Both of them are so feral that I can't get anywhere near them. I was worried for a while because I didn't see the mother, but and as I lay in bed, I could hear the kitten yowling under the house. But I did spot her, although I haven't seen them recently, so the landlord may have set traps elsewhere to catch them. I don't know. Um... I have seen other feral cats in the trailer park that I know are feral. Um, there's one that used to come around here a lot, and then um, some. one of the cats that was hanging around here chased her off, and she'll wander around periodically, but she won't let me get anywhere near her anymore for some reason. And as much as I hated to do it, I did have to put Duracell back outside. I just couldn't keep it up with him shitting all over the house. Even if I got all of it up before I went to work, when I came home, there would be plenty more waiting for me. And the same was true when I woke up. I waited until after dark on last Friday to let him out. That reduced the risk of my landlord or anyone who works for him seeing Duracell. So far, it's been enough to keep him safe. And Leela, as I said, is still in the house. And Fuzznots and Buttons aren't happy about it, but they're not as aggressive against her as they once were, and unlike Duracell, she will eat regardless of their attitude. Duracell just was hardly eating when I had them out and about, so. I will keep you posted on Duracell, but he's been known to disappear for over a year, so it may be a while before I have anything to report after this episode. I don't know. He's been showing up regularly, so we'll see. Now, as many of you will have no doubt noticed, this is the 200th episode, and I know a lot of people like to make a big deal on their podcast when they hit a certain episode number or have been podcasting for some number of years. I don't really like to do that. Partially, it has to do with not really being the kind of person to toot their own horn, but also it has to do 
with what happened when Art Bell's talk show hit a milestone of affiliate stations. I think it was 200 stations, but it doesn't really matter. Anyways, on the episode where he did a celebration, he played clips of people congratulating him for his achievement. And I quickly realized that there wasn't much else to the episode. He'd talk for a moment and then say something like, Now a message from so-and-so which would basically be the same type of congratulations the previous person gave him. He'd stack them up before and after commercial breaks as well, so there'd be minutes of these things you'd have to endure before you got back to him saying little more than, and now here's a message from so-and-so. Drove me nuts, because I was working third shift at a stop and rob, and there really wasn't anything else that the radio I had could pick up other than Art Bell. Well, country music, but fuck if I'm going to listen to that shit. So aside from this mention, that's all I'm going to say about the subject. Though I will admit that this episode is going to be a bit different than usual. There has been a mass of various stories in the news about all kinds of shit that I'd normally cover, but this week I'm going to take one story, and one you probably didn't hear about, that I think illustrates a larger problem in our society. The reason I picked this story is that it has elements which touch on a lot of aspects about news coverage, politics, technology, and the like without actually being tied to those things in such a way as to trigger too many biases. Now, some people will hear the story and they'll automatically jump to the wrong conclusions about it, no matter what I say, since it does cover some controversial areas. But I'm hoping that the majority of you out there will be able to hear the story and keep an objective mind about it while I discuss it and expound upon the issues which it should raise, but it doesn't. It comes from gizmodo.com. Don't panic, but Idaho State University lost some weapons-grade plutonium. Just in time for the weekend, the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission proposed an $8,500 fine to Idaho State University for losing track of a single gram of weapons-grade plutonium, missing since 2004. Great. The commission statement detailed the loss of the plutonium, which, according to the Associated Press, is enough to make a dirty bomb. Remember that line. The university was found in violation of two in our Nuclear Regulatory Commission requirements, according to the Commission's issued statement on the fine. It reads in part, The apparent violations involved the failure to control and maintain surveillance of licensed special nuclear material, 10 CFR 20.1801, and the failure to provide information required by regulation to the Commission that was complete and accurate in all material Respects, 10 CFR 70.9. The plutonium itself, named source AP-237, is a sealed source, a term describing a radioactive source that is prevented from releasing its radioactive material, and has a half-life of 24,100 years. It most closely resembles a quarter, which is the perfect explanation for why it's not in storage and probably in some vending machine off campus. Kidding! The plutonium was used as a nuclear accident dosimeter, which measures radiation exposure. It was one of 14 one-gram plutonium pieces loaned to the university by the Idaho National Laboratory, which is run by the U.S. Department of Energy in 1991. Scary stuff, right? I mean, not only is it radioactive, but since plutonium is a heavy metal, it's poisonous as well. The problem is, however, that this article doesn't give the whole truth and couldn't even if the author actually knew it, which they probably don't. I want to point out that the uh, that the line, the plutonium was used as a nuclear accident dosimeter, can't be right. Because a dosimeter, generally, um, doesn't have anything radioactive in it. It simply detects radiation exposure levels. Uh, I know at one time they were um, they were a colored badge that people would wear, and they had like um, I guess some kind of litmus paper in them that would change colors based on exposure. Now, what they probably meant, but because they don't know anything about 
radioactive materials is that it was used to test dosimeters. That would make sense, but I don't know. And before I go any farther, I want to give what is the most likely scenario for what happened to the material. Odds are that back in 2003, the university sent the stuff off with the various other radioactive material it has to dispose of routinely. Stuff like radioactive medical waste and the like, and the paperwork got lost. So no need to panic that this is going to wind up in the hands of terrorists or anything like that. This, however, leads to the nut of the issue. Even if terrorists had gotten their hands on the stuff, it wouldn't be anything to worry about. Yes, it's toxic. Yes, it's radioactive. But it's only a gram of the stuff. So the, only, so the only way that it could really be a threat to a person is if they swallowed it, which is unlikely since it's about the size of a quarter, or they somehow had it close to their person for a long period of time. Like they put it on a keychain or something and kept it in their pockets for 20 years. Yet you'll notice that early in the article it says that this is enough to make a dirty bomb. Which isn't wrong, but it's like saying that World War II was a bit of a bother. It in no way accurately conveys anything remotely useful in the way of information while conveying wildly inaccurate information. Let's take a worst case scenario for what happened to the stuff. It wound up in the hands of a white supremacist who will use it to make a dirty bomb and detonate this at a Black Lives Matter rally. Now, we're talking about a quarter of a teaspoon of highly radioactive material. Depending upon the power of the bomb, the stuff could be scattered over an area like a mile or more, or it could be confined to a city block. I don't know how to work the math on this, but imagine you have a quarter teaspoon of ground pepper that you want to spread evenly around a city block. There's going to be larger amounts of areas have almost no pepper on them at all. There are people who have been exposed to the same levels of plutonium that you'd find in such a situation, and they've apparently experienced no ill effects at all. I'll get to what might be wrong with that in a bit. For now, however, I just want to focus on what one might expect to happen if a dirty bomb containing a gram of plutonium contaminated a city block. We know what kind of exposure levels are needed to kill someone in a short period of time, and they're actually pretty high. If you've seen the movie Fat Man and Little Boy, you've seen a demonstration of what it takes when John Cusack's character has an accident while running a test on the core of a bomb. In the scene, Cusack's character is using a screwdriver to vary the height of two metallic hemispheres surrounding the core of plutonium. If the hemispheres are allowed to close for more than a minute, the core will go critical and explode. Even just a few seconds of the hemispheres being closed is enough to release deadly amounts of radiation. The screwdriver slips, the hemispheres close, and Cusack's character heroically grabs one of the hemispheres and flings it away. This stops the reaction from going critical, but exposes him to lethal levels of radiation, and nine days later he dies. I won't get into the complexities of what they changed from real life to make it fit into the movie, because they're rather inconsequential to the point. That did happen, and it did take nine days for him to die in a rather horrific and painful manner. The core weighed like 13 pounds. That's roughly six kilos for you in the civilized parts of the world. It took that much plutonium and a confined space to produce enough radiation to kill a person in a short period of time. Those of you who have seen the movie will remember that after Cusack's character tosses away the hemisphere, he yells at everyone else in the lab to drop a marker for where they're standing and to get out. He then starts doing math on the chalkboard. He's attempting to work out the dosage levels people in the lab were exposed to at the time of the accident. If you don't know, radiation follows what's known as the inverse square law meaning that exposure levels fall off dramatically over distance. Somebody two feet away from a radioactive object gets only a quarter of the dose that somebody a foot away from the object would get. Getting a quickly lethal dose of radiation from a gram of plutonium spread out over a city block is going to be impossible. Spread it out over a larger area, like a mile, and the risk is even smaller. Mind you, scattering a gram of over a city block is enough to cause a Geiger counter to react more vigorously than it otherwise would, 
but so will a radioisotope used as part of cancer treatment. There have been several cases of people who've been going through airport security after having gotten cancer treatments with radioactive materials, setting off the detectors and being detained while they could prove that they weren't carrying nuclear weapons material. So let's talk long-term effects of what being exposed to radiation is like. There's a great Der Spiegel article, and I'll have a link to it in the show notes, from about, and it's about 10 years old, and it details an investigation by the EU into an abandoned Soviet nuclear weapons factory. It had been abandoned after a bunch of nuclear waste exploded in the late 1950s, releasing more radiation than the Chernobyl accident did decades later. The people who worked in the plant were already exposed to high levels of radiation due to the lax safety protocols in the facility. Yet the number of deaths which can be attributed to the radiation exposure from working at the plant or being exposed to the fallout from the explosion are low. For example, while inhaling plutonium dust is said to be one of the surest ways of getting cancer from plutonium, and workers at the plant did inhale a lot of that dust, only 300 out of over 6,000 employees died of lung cancer. 200 of those were smokers, so it's possible that their deaths were caused by cigarettes, not plutonium. At Los Alamos, during the Manhattan Project, the people who were exposed to plutonium were given regular health checks for life. According to an article written by one of the doctors involved in that study, as a group, they were healthier than the general population in their age range. I'm not about to suggest that everyone should get exposed to plutonium for health benefits, because I'm sure that their better health can be explained by the fact that unlike most people, they got annual exams, they were also better educated and made more money than most people in their peer group, all of which would contribute to them being healthier. And it's also entirely possible that anything that they any conditions they might have had, which were caused by the exposure to the plutonium, would have been caught and dealt with long before anybody realized that, oh, this could have been caused by plutonium. If somebody got, you know, if one of those guys got a mole and they're like, well, let's just go ahead and take this off so it, in, in case it turns into skin cancer, we'll get it now before it does. Well, maybe that mole was caused by the plutonium and it would have eventually turned into some form of skin cancer and killed that person. But because they were getting annual checkups, it was caught. And because it hadn't turned malignant at that time, nobody realized that, oh, it was, you know, it, you know, that, it, that nobody thought about it being caused by the plutonium. And really, how can you tell when, you, when, you know, you can get moles, get cancerous moles caused by overexposure to the sun. All right, now let's go back to the scenario of a dirty bomb with a gram of the stuff being set off at a Black Lives Matter rally. Now, the credible media, such as NBC, CBS, CNN, The New York Times, etc., would claim that they're doing their best to give accurate reporting on the story, but they'd still use sensationalist headlines and would constantly talk about the fact that there was radioactive material in the bomb. You can bet that Michio Kaku would be on a bunch of channels predicting dire consequences to the people exposed to the plutonium. I know lots of people love Kaku, but after the Fukushima disaster, Kaku was saying that there would be horrific consequences because of the disaster, none of which have come to pass, despite the inept way much of the cleanup has been handled. He opposes the use of nuclear power for spacecraft like the Cassini probe or the New Horizons probe because if something were to go wrong during the launch, he's certain that the only possible result would be that Florida would wind up covered in radioactive material and everybody would suffer the effects of radiation poisoning. This is despite the fact that previous failures during launches which contained radioactive material have failed to cause this. I can recall seeing one interview with him on the 100th anniversary of Einstein publishing his theory of relativity, when Kaku was asked what modern technology was made possible because of Einstein's theory, Kaku's response was nothing. This is wrong. GPS satellites have to take into account relativistic effects in order to accurately compute your location. 
There are, I believe, a few other technologies which we use that also require the theory of relativity in order to make them work. So we're going to have this person who people wrongly consider to be an expert on TV telling everyone who happens to be in the same general area as that dirty bomb, they're all going to die. Son of the, sadly, none of the reporters interviewing him are likely to have enough understanding of science to be able to call him out on this. Now, the reason they're going to be doing this, first and foremost, is because it gets attention. We reward things like news networks for entertaining us, for lack of a better term. Yeah, you know, that there's uh, there's been several attempts to start a good news network where you know they just cover the positive news stories because everybody always complains about them. You know, and all they see are negative stories in the moon news. Those networks have always failed quickly. Why? Because that's really not what we pay attention to. We pay attention to the bad stuff. And the more, you know, the worse it is, the more sensational it is, the more it grabs our attention. You know, there's an old axiom in the news business, if it bleeds, it leads. So even though the guys at CBS, etc., etc., will try to put forward an accurate story, they're still going to shape that story in a way that's more likely to grab your attention, so you'll focus on it. Um, you know, if they said, there's nothing to worry about from this, you know, people wouldn't, wouldn't pay any attention to the news. And, you know, they need ratings, so they want people to pay attention to the news, so they, they hype it up. And they put somebody like Kaku on there who has no business talking about such things, uh, you know, and he'll, you know, he'll pump the fear factor because Kaku is irrationally afraid of nuclear energy. And then you're going to have the less reliable news outlets like Fox and the Washington Times. They are going to spin soft conspiracy theories, like it was an inside job, or that there's a connection between Black Lives Matter and ISIS. If there's a Democrat in the White House, they'll certainly try to hint that it's a false flag operation to try and take our guns or something. But that's not really what should be concerning to you. Not that what Fox would be doing is any good, but it's the sites like Breitbart, Infowars, and others of that same ilk which should be concerning. Unlike Fox and the Washington Times, they'll have no qualms about going full-bore conspiracy theory. They'll throw every idea you can imagine out there, and even many that you can't. What's worse, since the subject is a scary thing like radiation, which most people don't understand, they'll actually attract more attention than they normally would, because people will be convinced that the government is downplaying the dangers because they don't want to start a panic. Idiots like Alex Jones will rise in popularity, since he won't be seen as being beholden to corporate masters. Somebody will point out that this or that company has some kind of involvement with nuclear energy or nuclear medicine and buys lots of ads on a particular network or news site, and thus stories are being spiked because of it. And remember, we're down to just six different news or media companies in the U.S., and that number is getting smaller all the time. Fox is buying more, or Disney is buying. Fox, unless Comcast outbids them. Comcast already owns NBC. Um, Disney owns NBC. No, Disney owns ABC and Marvel and a whole bunch of other shit. Um, CBS is currently in a lawsuit with its parent company because they're trying to merge them back with Viacom that owns Paramount. And it's just getting worse. Even respectable news organizations will have to make note of what fucksticks like Alex Jones are saying simply because it will garner them some attention as well. And again, they probably will have somebody like Michu Kaku on there talking rather than some academic or other expert who actually understands this stuff and can say, no, really, it's just a gram. There is literally nothing to fucking worry about.
And, you know, with this added attention on sites like Breitbart, et cetera, et cetera, it will help fuel their popularity of them. Because even people who don't believe in such nonsense will feel compelled to check them out just to see if they really are as crazy as they've been hearing. And let's not forget that the Russians are spending oodles of money to sow chaos in the West. They will be posting anything and everything they can, as well as reposting anything that they think might cause disruptions in the U.S. There's no way of knowing how many people will swallow the bullshit or how many people will just throw up their hands and say that they just don't know and can't be bothered to try and figure it out. These people will also be more likely to disengage from the political process and not vote or vote based purely on a whim. And I'll get to it in a moment, but, you know, there's other things. Well, we know that the Russians have, you know, they funneled a bunch of money to the NRA to fund the ad campaigns that the NRA has done, as well as the donations the NRA has made to, you know, various Republican candidates. No doubt the Russians will funnel money to people to buy ads on things like Breitbart, Alex Jones, etc., etc., to, you know, ensure that those guys are more profitable and can better spread their message of insanity because it sows chaos here. And while we can't know what the overall effect on our society is, it is certain that fewer people will trust the news media or the government in the wake of such an event. This will be detrimental to the functioning of our society with potentially dire consequences. And I want to point out that we're already seeing similar effects in the U.S. right now. Part of the reason some folks voted for Trump was because they think that the only solution to the problems in the U.S., such as income, inequality, racism, etc., is to burn everything down and start again. They didn't vote for Trump because they thought that he would be a swamp-draining savior who'd solve all of our problems. They voted for him because they knew he'd rip this country apart. They believe that our society is so rotten it cannot be reformed peaceably and that it must be torn down as violently and as quickly as possible so that a new, more just society can replace it. That, of course, doesn't happen all, all that often. <laughs> That's generally not how these things work, however. And when you're dealing with a society as complicated as ours, not a good plan at all when you consider the kind of damage that can be done to the environment, not to mention all the innocent lives lost. We live in a society where you make money not by being right, but by attracting the most attention, as I said earlier. And quite often, how you gain that attention is by saying the craziest shit imaginable. Facebook, for example, didn't care that various groups were posting highly inaccurate ads. All they cared about was that those ads got the most attention. And it's not just Facebook. Les Moonves, the head of CBS News, even said that while he didn't think that Trump was good for the country, he was certainly good for the ratings at CBS, and that's what mattered. And this was said during the campaign. Regardless of how you might feel about Bernie Sanders, you have to recognize the absurdity of the major news outlets preferring to show an empty podium where Trump was scheduled to speak instead of showing Bernie giving a speech at that moment. Yet this is what happened. The networks did it because they knew that they were guaranteed an audience by talking about Trump. They had no idea if they'd get an audience if they talked about Bernie. To be fair, some percentage of the people tuning in were only doing so for the same reason that people slow down as they pass a car wreck. They want to gawk at the scene. The result of this, however, wasn't tying up traffic. It was handing over control of the government to an inept boob. So, how do we fix it? Because unless we do something, this problem is only going to get worse. And we cannot afford another Trump, let alone someone who is worse, which we could potentially get if Pence takes office after Trump is impeached, assuming Trump does get impeached. Unlike Trump, Pence has an idea of how government works and can more inf effectively inflict his crazy ideas upon the world than Trump can. And I want to point out that 
He's a uh, Pence is a dominionist who thinks we should do what we can to bring about the rapture. Because he wants to say, save us. To solve this problem, and it's critical that we do, each one of us is going to have to make a concerted effort in the coming months and years to not only hold media organizations accountable by telling them, hey, you're wrong on this, or hey, you guys shouldn't cover this at all, you should cover something else, and we're going to have to do the same thing with politicians. And that's just the part of what we have to do. I know people like to say that sunlight is the best disinfectant, so it's a positive by showing everyone stories about white supremacists, etc., etc. But if sunlight really was the best disinfectant, Trump would not be president. He got more coverage than anyone else running in the campaign. And yes, I know he only won on a technicality. Does it matter? We should not have gotten that close. He should not have, he should never have won the Republican nomination at all. But because he was a sensationalist, and that's what we aim for in our society, that's what we pay attention to, the sensational things, not the mundane things. You know, everybody is enraptured with, say, the military hero who does this, you know, like the, the, the SEAL team that flew in on the helicopters and whacked bin Laden. And I'm, I'm not putting those guys down at all. They did a very, very risky operation. An operation that was made possible by lots of people behind the scenes who had to do a number of very difficult things to pull that all off. I mean, you had the intelligence analysts who had to figure out, this is most likely where bin Laden is, you know, and here's why. And then go convince everybody in the government that, they were right, and they and we could find Obama there. But you also, you know, the guys that had to make the equipment that the, the soldiers used. Soldiers, they're sealed. The team members, so they're sailors. Um, they had, you know, they had to do a lot of things right. And, you know, I have made aircraft equipment. I have made aerospace equipment. I have made gun parts. Um they, they all, you know, you've got to do it right if you want to be guaranteed that that stuff will work. Uh, in the, um, the documentary For All Mankind, which is done by Al Reiner, who is the co-author of, uh, the, the co-writer of the Apollo 13 screenplay, he play you know, there, you hear an interview with one of the Apollo astronauts talking about sitting in the capsule, look, you know, waiting for launch. And they're, you know, they're strapped to the top of a giant fucking bomb, and it's got millions of parts in it, and it's being, you know, they're all being asked to do something that's never really been done before. And, you know, the, the astronaut says that in his mind, and he, you know, and it, they had instilled it on everyone you know, in the minds of everyone who worked on the Apollo project, from, you know, the guys digging the ore out of the ground to the, you know, the guys putting it all together. This won't fail because of me. And, you know, Armstrong and all those guys, they get all the glory for having gone to the moon. But that was only possible because of all the effort that people behind the scenes put in and to their credit the astronauts will all mention various people involved in the Apollo program and the other various manned programs whom they have a great deal of respect for because they know what those people did the um the, the, one of the things that they did with the Apollo program and I believe they did it with the shuttle and I would assume they're doing it with the um, the Orion program, is it was a thing that um, the uh, 
they, that, that the U.S. pioneered during World War II. There were certain flight crews who were, you know, they were picked together, they, you know, they, they were put together, and then they were sent to the factories to, you know, oversee the construction of the plane that they would fly. The reason for this was because those guys knew that their lives would be riding in that aircraft. So they would be more concerned than the guys on the line, or women, I should say, since there were a lot of women in the factories at that point in time. Um, you know, they would have, their, their attention would be focused on details that the, the assembly line workers would miss. And all of us need to try and do something like that with the news. We need to recognize that this has an impact. The stories they cover, how they cover them. And we need to, you know, let the news companies know, hey, you're not covering this story right. This person shouldn't be on the air because they're always wrong. You're not, you know, calling out somebody who's wrong simply because they're a politician. The, the whole blow up with the fucking White House Correspondents Dinner. Where, you know, they were like, well, she said something about Sarah Huckabee Sanders' makeup. I mean, you know, let's face it, that's whatever you might think of Michelle Wolf's comments. They pale in comparison to shit that, pe that Trump has said about people on air and not in a, you know, not merely that, that Access Hollywood interview. Um... The shit he said about, uh, what's her name, who killed her daughter? Carly Fiorina. I couldn't remember Eli's joke that she killed her kid, but I couldn't remember her name. <laughs> and one other thing I will point out, uh, there is a, a tech reporter, and I, I know I've mentioned this in the show in the past, but I'll bring it up again. Tech reporter um, by the name of Paul Farratt. And Farratt while he's a good reporter in a, some ways, he tends to be rather slavish in his affection towards Microsoft products and companies who produce Microsoft supporting products. And when she was running for president, somebody asked him about Carly Fiorina, and he said he covered her when she was the head of HP. And he says, she is the dumbest person he's ever met in his life. And he, you know, for him to say that, it speaks volumes because that means she must be really fucking stupid if he's going to say something nasty about that. But it also illustrates the point that we need to call people like Therat out who, you know, tend not to be really objective. He, he can be, but he only tends to do that when it's obvious that popular opinion is against him. He was, you know, when Microsoft introduced Windows 8, he was all for it, thought it was a great interface, thought it was, you know, touch was definitely the future of, of desktop computing, and on and on and on. Only as more people got Windows 8 and decided, this is some shit. Did he start to say, well, okay, you know, there are a lot of problems here. And there there really are. Uh, there w were a lot of problems with Windows 8. It was fine for a tablet, but, you know, for a PC, desktop, no. Uh, you know, and forget the whole thing, I because I know Steve Jobs says that people, you know, you end up with, you know, with gorilla arms reaching up to the screen. I can't sit close enough to my monitor to be able to easily touch it and be able to see it. I mean, you know, the only way I can see the monitor easily at close up is without my glasses. I'm almost 50 years old. Well, you know, my eyes have shifted. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, some 18 year old kid can probably sit close enough, but I like, you know, I can't. And there are more of us who are of an age where our vision require you know dictates where we sit rather than us being able to sit where we want then there are people who can sit where they want uh, so you know 
There's no way it would be po it could possibly po be popular. And really, you know, it, it it's only occasionally that it would be kind of nice to be able to touch something on the screen. But, you know, that's the, the beauty of, of a, a mouse and a cursor is that you can shift things around. You know, occasionally it'd be nice to be able to touch it, but most of the time, no. Oh, I know, that's a little sidebar. Also, we're going to need stricter educational standards and policies put in place so that funding for education can't be cut. I don't know about the rest of the world, but here in the U.S., politicians working to destroy public education is a serious problem. One need only look at our current Secretary of Education for an example of the kind of people who need to be prohibited from having anything to do with education. And I'm not kidding about this last part. We need to codify in the law that political appointees must have qualifications for the positions they're appointed to. And, you know, it's not enough to say, well, we can expect the, poli you know, the, the, the Senate not to confirm them. That has been pro proven not to be the case. But even if it is, you know, even if we, if we can, you know, the next time it happens, you know, the, you know, the next president, they appoint somebody and the Senate says, well, this person's an idiot. We're, we're voting him down. The, you know, the president will then nominate somebody else. Well, they're not, you know, and the attitude of people will be, they're not as bad as, you know, the previous person. So we'll go ahead and approve their appointment. Um, there is a term for that, and I don't know what it is, but I, I give you an example in the real world. Uh, I think it's called helicoptering, maybe. Yeah, I think that's what it is. And here's why. Here's an example in the real world. Apparently, it's common practice when you're writing a screenplay. I mean, this is like the industry-known trick. If, you know, you're concerned that, well, this scene is going to be kind of expensive, we can't, you know, but we really want this scene in the movie, what are we going to do? they write what's known as a helicopter scene. And this helicopter scene is something that's shot from a helicopter. And it really doesn't add anything to the story or anything like that. But it's expensive to actually do that because you got to rent a helicopter. you got to pay the crew, the camera crew more, blah, blah, blah. And so, you know, the person who's reviewing the script sees the helicopter scene and says, oh, no, this is too expensive. We'll cut this out, and that then they ignore the other scene that the the you know the screenwriter really wanted in there that was kind of expensive and would have normally been cut, save for the fact that there was the helicopter scene in there. I hope I explained that in a way that makes sense. It's sort of like and 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 a, a slightly different way of looking at it is a company will introduce a product and they'll have three different models of it each one with a different price knowing that you'll see the low end price and think ooh that's kind of you know that's not too bad and then you'll you'll see the mid range price and you're like you know this is only a little bit more and it has a lot of what I want I think I'll get this instead. And they'll, you know, you'll see the high end price and they'll be like, that's just too high. So, and, and they don't, and the company actually does not plan on selling very middle, m many of the low end price items. They know everybody is going to want the mid range price. So that's where they focus their attention on. And that works. Um, that's talked about in either one of the Freakonomics books or Predictably Irrational. I can't remember which. So, a shitty president who wants to get some asshole friend of theirs appointed to a cabinet position would pick 
the worst possible candidate, put them up, knowing they'll get shot down immediately, and then put their friend in who, you know, everybody will go, well, they're not nearly as bad as the last one. Let's go ahead and approve this guy. So we have to codify that. That's why I say we have to codify in the law that certain people, you know, that they, they have to be qualified for a political appointee's job. I realize that will upset a lot of big, important people because, you know, one of the plums of donating to a political campaign is you get a gravy job, like being appointed the ambassador to some lovely tropical nation and or something like that and you actually don't really have to put in a lot of time you just show up every now and then you know um but you can spend most of your time back here in the states we don't need that we need people who have you know qualifications to be an ambassador in a position it sounds like a crazy idea i know but that's the way it ought to be we're also going to have to rethink our entire economic system for reasons which are way too complicated to go into here, but I will try and address them in a future episode. No, I'm not about to endorse something like communism. I just merely point out a lot of the downsides to capitalism that people don't see, even the people who are opposed to capitalism don't see these downsides. Or if they do, I haven't read it, come across anybody talking about it. And none of this is to say that these are the only solutions. They are not. They're the bare minimum of what we have to do in order to begin to fix things. I know a disturbing number of highly educated people who see nothing wrong with Trump. Some of the other solutions will only occur to us after we have started to make the necessary changes. We do know about. There'll be things that we cannot conceive of now, or would sound preposterous today if someone were to suggest them, but will make sense once we've begun to make the necessary changes to our society. One thing I will point out that we need to figure out a way of doing is um, every you know, highly respected in business. Take Toyota, take Nissan or Honda. They all have quality control procedures put in place that say, you know, when somebody discovers a problem with a procedure, you know, they, the team has to, you know, the company has to sit down and figure out a way to correct those problems. Uh, you know, and we need something like that with government. You know, so okay, we pass a bill with an, a certain intent to fix a problem. For example, we pass a law that to fix a certain problem. Right now, if that law is ineffectual, few people know about it, and the law isn't necessarily fixed. If, on the other hand, there's a mechanism in government that analyzes every law that's passed and says, this law has been effective at solving XYZ problem, you know, it's fine. While this other law has been ineffective at solving the problem it was intended to address, we need to fix the law, and it should be an automatic process where, you know, you don't have to write to your congressperson to say, hey, you know, I don't think this law is working. There should be a branch of the government that analyzes the laws and say, these ones are working, these ones aren't. Now, you know, correcting these problems has to go to the top of your agenda. So they can't just say, well, who cares about this or that law not working right. No, it has to go to the top of the agenda. It has to be addressed. It has to be fixed. That would solve a lot of problems, I think. The most important thing, however, is when or if the Democrats manage to gain control of all three branches of the federal government, we do
do not relax. We must seize the moment and push for changes far harder than we're presently pushing back against Trump and his ilk. Even if the Democrats manage to gain only a few seats in the midterms this year, we have to tell those who've won election to be bold. Tilt at those windmills, because that's the only way to gain any attention or traction. It is no exaggeration to say that our survival depends upon it. We all live in a moat of dust suspended in a sunbeam. Our existence, both as individuals and as a species, grows more fragile every day. If somehow someone tomorrow could develop the perfect source of energy, clean, cheap, and safe, and peace were to break out all over the world at the same time, our existence would still be threatened both by our past transgressions and by those unwilling to abandon the old ways. The vast sums of carbon dioxide we have spewed in such volume since the dawn of the Industrial Revolution will still warm our atmosphere and our planet unless we develop methods to remove them quickly. Species will continue to go extinct as we encroach on their habitats, joining the dinosaurs and the dodo, leaving future generations with a world that is filled with far fewer wonders than we know now. I don't know about you, but I don't want to live in a world where the only places elephants can be found are zoos, if they can be found at all. I want to live in a world where there are places elephants, lions, tigers, and even reborn woolly mammoths, dodos, passenger pigeons, and maybe even some dinosaurs have places to roam freely. A world where even the poorest person doesn't have to worry about where their next meal is going to come from or how much it might cost to see a doctor. This can happen, but we're all going to have to work at it, and we have to start now. Okay, that's it for now. Um, again, I apologize for the delay. Next episode will be from the. Uh, it will be Skullbeard and I reading from the Rastafarian Gospel, as I <laughs> call it. Um, it will go out this weekend, and not the episode after that will be some sort of news episode. I am going to have to. I got to figure out some way of of redoing things here a little bit. Um, simply because I've got to clean this cat shit up. <laughs> so, I and it's going to take me some time, and that means my free time to record the podcast and work on it is going to be impacted. So, rather than have another huge delay like this, I'm going to have to figure something out so that I can get an episode out when it's supposed to, as well as uh clean up the cat shit I haven't gotten to yet. <sighs> That's it for this episode of The Atheist in the Trailer Park Podcast. You can subscribe to the show on iTunes, Stitcher, as well as just about anywhere else podcasts can be found. Many of the episodes are also on YouTube. Follow the show on Twitter. At T Park Atheist is the show's Twitter handle. It's on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash trailerparkatheist.com. If you happen to like the podcast, please rate it on iTunes. If you'd like to support the podcast, there's a donate button on the show notes page. You can support it via Patreon at patreon.com forward slash TN Tucker. Thanks for listening. Say goodnight, Fuzznuts. All I know is this violates every canon of respectable broadcasting. Damned cat.